So welcome everyone. This is Joanne Gear. I'm Executive Director for the Westchester Biotech Project. And welcome to our webinar on building the rare disease research community. And you'll be hearing shortly from Dr. Wendy Chung and Dr. Melina Pashan. But first I'd like to introduce our co-founder, Michael Welling, to say a few words. Are you there, Michael? Can you unmute yourself? Michael. I'm here. Can you hear me? There you go. Mm -hmm. okay. All right. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, Michael Welling, co-founder of the Westchester Biotech Project, and I want to uh, thank everyone for joining us today, and I am uh, really excited for the presentation today, uh, mainly because this whole rare disease space is really something that uh, our organization has found some momentum in, and it's a, it's a space where uh, we are finding tremendous uh, partners, as you will see today from the presentation, as well as tremendous opportunity to uh, affect change and sort of move the proverbial needle, if you will. Uh, so thank you, everyone. Um, thank you, Wendy. Thank you, Antonio. And uh, I'm looking forward to to learning some stuff, uh, not understanding all of it, I'm sure, and uh, certainly some of the questions from the audience. Thank you. Thank you, Michael. Um, so again, this is Joanne Gear. I'm the executive director for the Westchester Biotech Project. And essentially, we work closely with researchers, engineers, and data scientists to develop programs, listen to their interests and concerns, and build a broader community. Uh, today, we're going to be really launching, this whole spring, we're launching our concept to build a rare disease hub in the area, um, which will be focused in Westchester County, New York, but with connections across the state, across the country, across the globe. Uh, a number of organizations have been supporting us, and we very much appreciate every one of them. Some of them are alliance partners, other nonprofits that bring different valuable content to the story. Some are financial partners. Um, all of them get involved and, on an ongoing basis and typically will choose the programs and projects that interest them the most. But, but we really have a wonderful and, and engaged uh, community that is international already. Uh, we're going to get started in a moment. Feel free to put your questions in the chat box. Uh, we will hear uh, presentations first and then have the questions at the end. Um, if there's a particular slide that you'd like to ask a question about, it's smart if you just keep, you know, if you can mention which slide it is so at the end we can go back to it. Um, you're going to hear today from uh, Dr. Wendy Chung, but first I'd like to introduce uh, Dr. Melina Pashant, who is really the, uh, the leader in the development of our rare disease hub. Antonio, would you like to introduce yourself? Sure. Uh, hello, everybody. Uh, my name is Antonio Molina. I am a bio-entrepreneur focused on rare diseases. By training, I have a PhD in molecular and cell biology and a master's in business administration. Uh, I was a scientist, a bench scientist, uh, many years ago, but I quit the job to focus on being an entrepreneur. In New York, in Westchester, uh, I am working to put together a project that will generate a bio-incubator where startups focused on rare diseases uh, can, uh, can work and can produce new drugs uh, to try to help uh, these patients. I'm really happy to be here today with Dr. Chang and also with uh, Joanne, Michael, and the rest of the team. Thanks a lot. Thank you so much. Um, I'm going to briefly introduce Dr. Wendy Chung. She is a board-certified clinical geneticist. She received her MD from Cornell University and her PhD in molecular genetics from Rockefeller University. She is director of the clinical genetics program at Columbia, a co-director of the molecular genetics diagnostic labs, and heads a research laboratory in the division of molecular genetics, investigating the genetic basis for a variety of Mendelian and complex traits. Dr. Chung. Thank you, Joanne. Thank you, Antonia. Um, so I hope this will be uh, setting the stage in terms of thinking about how we get to diagnose conditions, rare genetic conditions, and then more importantly, even moving on to the treatment and the support for those individuals and their families. Next slide. Um, you can go ahead, Joanne. 
Um, so as we're doing this, just as an outline of what we're going to talk about today, um, I'll try and, uh, although I'm a pedi trained as a pediatrician, um, and I'm going to talk to you mostly about conditions that are seen in children, uh, I do also take care of adults, and some of these conditions predominantly affect adults, so it won't be exclusively about kids, but um, many of the conditions disproportionately do affect younger individuals. Uh, as we're doing this, I hope I can bring you up to date, at least in terms of what our diagnostic tools in genetics and genomics can and can't do for us. And as I said, um, trying to outline for you what does getting a diagnosis get you? Um, you know, how, how is that helpful and how importantly can we use that information to be able to develop better treatments? Next slide. So with this, um, I think part of why a di diagnosis matters is a bit of a cosmic question, um, which is that I think many people, when they start symptomatically having a problem, want to know what it is, um, and importantly for that, what to expect, as well as um, beyond what to expect, what can they do about it? How can they make the symptoms better? Uh, how can they make sure it doesn't get any worse? And with that, the genetics can oftentimes be the best tool in terms of being able to uh, pinpoint exactly what that is. Um, I can't promise that right now with each diagnosis, we automatically have a magic bullet in terms of something that cures the condition or makes it all better. Uh, in some cases we do, and unfortunately in most we don't yet, uh, but it does help to narrow down the treatment options and in some cases even point out things that may not be helpful, uh, that may be a waste of time or resources or even potentially make things worse. Um, for some families uh, that are thinking about having children, uh, there is an issue that comes up in terms of will it happen again, um, and are there ways to be able to avoid that if that's a desire. Um, and so there are multiple technologies that don't involve abortion, but to be able to help families have healthy children. Um, and there's a bit of a cosmic question, which is just, as I was alluding to before, the why. Um, why now? Why me? Why this? Um, and being able to provide some closure. Next slide. So with that, um, that's what happens for someone who's already symptomatic. Uh, there are also is increasingly a set of individuals who are trying to think ahead. That is that they're not symptomatic yet, um, they're still healthy, and we want to maintain them in that way. We want to make sure that they continue to, to stay healthy. But when you think about it, for all of us, um, you know, there are different health threats that could be out there, whether they be cancer or heart disease or stroke or diabetes. Um, and for any one person to try and think about what's most threatening to them personally at this point in their life, um, genetics can be helpful, not for everyone every time, but in some cases can be. And so it can help um, in an increasingly complicated world to be able to make priorities, uh, be able to decide where to focus your energies in terms of screening, uh, monitoring, prevention, and being able to that over a life course in real time. So there may be different threats at different times in your life and being able to continue to iterate and, and um, prioritize as you go through life. Um, and as I said, in some cases, although it may not be something where you can completely, completely prevent the condition or cure the condition, you can plan for things. And, and there are some people that are just planners. They like being able to anticipate. They don't like surprises. And so information could be helpful in that way. Next slide. So uh, this is enabled. It's a bit of a cliche, but this is enabled by the decreasing cost of sequencing. So on the x-axis is... Uh, over time, and on the y-axis, you'll notice there's a logarithmic scale to what's happened to the cost of sequencing per genome. Um, the first genome that were se was sequenced around the world was $3 billion. Uh, the last genome that was, at least I had sequenced, was less than $1,000. So you can see that there's been a dramatic decrease in the cost of sequencing. Um, and in fact, at this point, it's as much about data computing, uh, storage of data, and computing on data as it is actually generating the data. So um, it, it, this is a strong enabler of the things I'm going to tell you about. Next slide. Um, however, even though that cost has decreased, it's still, um, as I was alluding to, a lot of data, a lot to compute on. And so we have figured out ways of taking shortcuts on that. This is what your genome looks like. And it's the end of an afternoon. You may be getting kind of tired. Um, when you look at this, it's not completely clear how to make heads or tails of this. Next slide. But if I highlight certain portions for you, um, you can see some little gold nuggets of information in here, the Gettysburg Address. Um, and that's the way our genomes are set up. They're little gold nuggets that are not necessarily contiguous. And uh, we call these exons. They're the portions of genes that are coded or turn into parts of them of genes, at least that we recognize as being functional right now. And we can take a short 
shortcut and just look at that. It's about 2% of the genome that contains this coding information. Take a shortcut and decrease our work by almost two orders of magnitude. Next slide. So we call that when we uh, sequence all of those exons, we call that exome sequencing, putting all of that together. And like I said, at least in the early days, uh, it was a shortcut that we took when the cost of sequencing was even more than it is now. But it's proven, at least for right now, still to be uh, quite a, a useful way of approaching genetic analysis in a comprehensive way, but yet cost-effective way. Next slide. So as we go through and do this, um, one thing that's interesting, uh, again, I see, I'm a clinician, I see patients. Um, one misconception I'll try and uh, dispel is that individuals sometimes come to see me and they'll say, um, you know, it's really lovely to be here and to meet you. We're hoping that you're going to be helpful, but we really can't see how you could be helpful because when we look at our family, either, you know, for an indication like cancer or autism or a birth defect, um, you know, they'll look very carefully at their family history in part because we guide them to do that. And they'll say, you know, we, we've got clean genes. Uh, no one else in our family has this condition. So there's really no way this could be genetic because genes are passed down um, and we don't see any of that in our family. Um, and while it is true that genes are passed down and for many conditions, we're talking about heritable factors, there are certain conditions, uh, especially those that are very impactful. Um, so things that affect people when they're young, uh, even potentially newborns or even fetuses, things that are so impactful that individuals might not even live, uh, live a long period of time or live to have children of their own. Many times those are due to genetic factors that actually start brand new with that child. Um, and that sounds a little odd, but our genomes are built of three billion alphabet letters, three billion A's, T's, D's, and G's. And in fact, when we as humans go on to have children, um, we have a lot of information to copy over to pass down. And as we do that, we have things like spell checkers in place to try and make sure that we've copied over the information correctly. But if you can imagine, three billion letters is a lot of information to copy over, and we're just human. And in fact, within that process, on average, each of us make about 100 to 150 mistakes uh, in our genomes that are passed down to our children. That is that there are 100 to 150 spots in our children that are brand new and not the same as either one of the parents. And in about 1% of children that are born, one of those 100 or 150 genetic changes falls squarely within a gene that matters and in changes a gene in a way that matters. And so can we call this result in a de novo or brand new genetic change associated with the condition. And I've shown you in here in this slide, uh, it could be that it's associated with autism. There's a lot of data to support conditions like autism as, or as I'll show you in a little bit, congenital heart disease or other birth defects, but that can be a portion of the where these conditions come from. This actually helps us out quite a bit to identify these genetic conditions because we do a relatively simple experiment where we sequence the genome of the mother, the father, and the child, and we do a simple comparison, looking at the child for every single spot and seeing did that variance, did that genetic difference come from mom or come from dad, and we can sort of check off the box if it came from one or the other, um, but we can also very readily identify when that genetic change came from neither one of them. That is that we can really, through a few keystrokes, uh, be able to program and code the uh, pipelines to look at the information to identify all of the de novo genetic variants in a child. Next slide. So that's one of the strategies that we've used, and I'll actually uh, tell you about it in the next couple cases. So just to make this, um, I hope, relatable, to, to get a sense of the types of patients this can affect, um, this was a little girl who came to see me when she was nine years old, and uh, her parents had come at the advice of her neurologist because she had had seizures literally from the day she was born. Um, and unfortunately, they were what we call medically refractory. So in other words, her neurologist had tried several different kinds of anti-epileptics or anti-seizure medication, but none of them were completely able to control her seizures. So she still had breakthrough seizures. As a result of that, secondarily, she had um, really some other brain problems, some other neurological problems, including the fact that she was severely delayed and, and in fact, intellectually disabled. Um, and with that, she also, her brain had not been growing well. She had microcephaly and also had some problems with the way her body was working. She had some movements um, that were abnormal. So all of that uh, showing us that she had had damage to her brain 
really secondarily to nine years worth of seizures. Um, again, just like many of my patients, she had no family history of a similar condition, but we went ahead and did use the approach that I had just mentioned. Next slide. Um, her, her experience for me was extremely bittersweet. Um, and the reason I say that is the, the sweet part of it, the, the part that was good about this is we were in fact able to make a diagnosis for her. This is a rare condition, uh, really a very rare genetic condition, one that I happen to know fairly well because one of my colleagues, Daryl DeVivo, described it uh, quite a while ago. Um, and it's due to a problem with being able to get glucose or sugar to the brain. So there's uh, a protective barrier around your brain. We call it the blood-brain barrier, uh, trying to keep your brain safe and free of other things that shouldn't be getting up there. Um, and one of the things, though, is that it's required, many things require transport to be able to get into the brain. And sugar is one of those that requires transport. And our brains normally run on sugar. She had a mutation in the gene uh, or in the protein that's responsible for transporting that sugar to her brain. So it was as if her brain, literally from the day she was born, was chronically, her fuel tank was running on empty. Um, she chronically was not getting enough fuel or sugar to her brain to allow it to work correctly. And as a result, uh, her brain was stalling out. It was basically seizing or not getting enough energy to run correctly. Uh, the reason I say it was bittersweet is because uh, the sweet part was that, again, knowing what this was, it was very easy to now come up with a, a treatment for her seizures, um, and that was simply to change her fuel source. Rather than having her body, her brain, rely on glucose to be able to function correctly, we could simply change her fuel source to that of uh, essentially what people used to call a ketogenic diet or an Atkins diet. In other words, something where she's relying mostly on protein or fat. Uh, but not carbohydrates, not sugars. And so uh, we did that and very quickly, her seizure stopped abruptly, very quickly, very definitively. Um, what was bittersweet about that though is even though her seizures were controlled and fixed, um, the problems she had had in terms of the intellectual disabilities were not reversible. So she continued, despite being able to treat her seizures, continued having the same problems, the same delays, the same movement problems that she had had. And if we had made that diagnosis much earlier, so if we had made that diagnosis, for instance, that nine weeks of age, nine days of age, perhaps even nine hours of age, the outcome would have been completely different. Uh, but unfortunately, because she had gone through so many years of having had seizures, having had that uh, um, sort of chronic low blood sugar in her brain, there was irreversible damage that was done. And so I'll get to it in a second, but uh, you know, and part of our mantra has been now, not just make the diagnosis, but make it quickly, efficiently, and early in life, or as early as possible in life. Next slide. So um, to show you an example of just how early we're trying to think about this, um, I'm going to even roll this back. So not even uh, nine hours of age, but even thinking about, I'll call it T minus uh, nine hours, nine days, nine weeks of age. But even thinking about before the baby is born to make sure that we give children the best chance at a healthy life. So this was uh, a mother who came to me while she was pregnant in her third trimester, and she came because on her ultrasound, when they uh, looked at the fetus growing inside her womb, they saw that the fetus had an irregular heartbeat instead of being, you know, boom, boom, boom. Uh, it was seemed to be skipping beats, and there was fluid around the, the baby, um, the fetus. So it was what we call hydropic. Um, within that, everything else looked fine. The heart structurally looked fine, and there's no history of any problem, any family history of similar issues. So we were a little bit puzzled in terms of what this was. Um, but I had a hint based on some other patients that I had had over the years that this might be what we call an arrhythmia, a heart rhythm problem, and that might be genetic in terms of the underlying basis. Next slide. So we went forward to do prenatal testing in this particular case using a similar strategy to what I described before. And in this case, then again, it became very clear very quickly that this was a de novo or a new genetic change associated with a condition that we call long QT syndrome. Um, it's a channel, and I won't go into a lot of details about this, but a particular way that electricity flows through the heart and a disruption of that normal conduction through the heart. Um, the good news about this, and this is 
a good news story. Um, the good news about this is that by knowing about this ahead of time, we were able to search the medical literature. We were able to uh, check in with other doctors, other families who'd had similar conditions. In fact, uh, the same exact genetic change that this child had, and we're able to plan with those few weeks left we had in the pregnancy to know that she should be treated with a particular very safe medication called a beta blocker, um, and we knew exactly what to monitor, what to expect, uh, and what to check for. And in fact, I'm very proud, very glad to say uh, she's now three years old. Um, she has been on the beta blocker since she was born and has had absolutely no problems with her heart, uh, has not had any problems in terms of either passing out or arrhythmias or having her heart stop, uh, has not even required what we call a defibrillator or a pacemaker, um, has been able to, to do this, uh, have lived a completely healthy and normal life. Next slide. Um, so in terms of this, we've gone, uh, as you can see, these are two very specific use cases for this, but we've gone and we've thought about the same strategy of being able to use this genetic testing across even some conditions that might look the same on first glance, but in fact are, can be quite different. Um, and so we've looked uh, at individuals who have different types of birth defects or congenital anomalies, things they're born with that are structurally different in their bodies. Um, and this was a study that we had done several years ago around congenital heart disease, or CHD. Um, and as we did this, this was relatively early on in the days that we had done it, so way back in 2013, but we realized even at that time that it, it, as many as 10 to 20% of all children born with congenital heart disease had changes uh, new changes in, in genes that we had never before appreciated were associated with heart development. Um, one of the things we realized, though, was that even though congenital heart disease might look quite similar um, in terms of just looking at the plumbing of the heart, we could estimate that there were going to be at least 500 different genes associated with that. Next slide. So one of the challenges that we've realized is that even though babies at the time of birth might look like they have the same plumbing problems, the same congenital heart disease. In fact, as they grow up, um, they, they don't all turn out the same. They have different challenges. Um, and so we started looking at those that had these genetic changes that I talked about, and looking at their outcomes, how they did long term. And as we did that, we could see, and I won't, I'm going to focus your attention on the right side of the slide where we see these red bars. Um, if we looked at how frequently we saw these types of changes, if we saw them in a child, um, sort of the baseline in terms of this is that we don't usually see these at all. Um, and in terms of the percentage that we see these in with congenital heart disease, if they had congenital heart disease plus a neurodevelopmental disorder or problems in terms of either things like having attention deficit or problems with delays or problems as severe as intellectual disability, if they had a neurodevelopmental issue as well as the congenital heart disease, we saw uh, these particular genetic changes much, much more frequently, 7 to 8 percent of those individuals. If they had another birth defect or another congenital anomaly or CA, then we saw it in about 10 percent of those individuals. And if they had both another congenital anomaly plus a neurodevelopmental issue, we saw it in about 20 percent of those individuals. So we could quickly start to see um, some of the challenges that those children had as they were growing up and could anticipate those and prepare for them. So screen for those conditions, be able to surgically correct them if we needed to, be able to support them with early interventions in school. And someday we may be able to go even beyond that in terms of specific treatment. Next slide. So as we did that, um, and this is some biology, which I won't spend too much time on today, but I put it up here and the slides will be posted for anyone who's really interested. We started to understand much, much better at a high level what the biology is that's responsible for this. And so this is simply to show you literally some of the inventory of the genes that are involved, um, some of the targets. So for those of you who think about this therapeutically, some of the targets that may be involved, um, and to think about now you know, how you can strategically be able to develop strategies, whether they be things like small molecules or pills that would be taken, whether they be things like gene replacement or gene editing, which I'll get to in the end. But now we know it, at least what it is where we need to focus our attention. Next slide. Um, so as we've been doing that, we've set up a clinical program as well. So some of what I described um, in the last section was about research that we've done, but we've always done this with the idea that we could translate this into something that were immediately accessible to families in real time, um, that this wasn't just, you know, sort of a, something we did in the ivory towers at Columbia, but something that our families, especially in the New York City area, could get access to. 
So we developed a, a program, the acronym is DISCOVER, but it's a diagnosis initiative seeking care and opportunities with vision for research uh, or visions for exploration and research. Um, and as we've done this, the idea is that we can come to a diagnosis, but we can also move forward from that in terms of now translating that diagnosis into either something that is actionable, something that can be done, uh, but as well being able to turn that sometimes into research that's necessary to provide the therapies of tomorrow. And with that, we bring all the resources of Columbia behind us. So uh, the very best of the very best in terms of clinicians to help support those individuals and their families. Next slide. Um, as we've done that, um, this is just a small example, but I think the count as of this morning was 41 additional genes that we've identified, brand new genes for various different human conditions. Uh, all of these are relatively rare disorders on the order of one in 100,000 to in some cases one in a million. Um, but these collectively, even though they are individually rare, collectively they're actually quite common. Um, and I think that's one of the things I wanted to emphasize is that uh, there may be many individuals in the community that don't even realize they have one of these conditions. Um, they just, uh, we haven't had the tools to be able to look before. Next slide. So as we've been doing this, uh, one of the things that's interesting for me to see is that um, I deal not with uh, just one condition, but I actually have the great honor of being able to work with families across many different conditions, and we've realized there's quite a bit of convergence, um, that some conditions we thought were totally unrelated, in fact, are related in many ways, um, so that conditions that you might think of as being quite disparate, things like schizophrenia, epilepsy, congenital heart disease, autism. In fact, we know that in many cases, it's the same genes that are involved across those different conditions. In some cases, even the same exact genetic changes. Uh, and so this has really helped us to understand fundamentally the biology. And biology of, for instance, when it comes to conditions like schizophrenia or like autism, have been very difficult to think about how to develop treatments um, because we haven't even known what the fundamental problem was. We haven't understood the biology very well. And so this is now giving us really um, things that are hard anchors or, or real pillars in terms of our knowledge to be able to move forward with understanding how we can intervene. Next slide. So um, as we've done this, uh, as I was saying, my great pleasure is actually to work with families. And one of the things that I think it's really been, only been within this era where we've had Facebook, where we've had social media, where we've had the internet, we've been able to actually bring families together with rare conditions. So even though they might be individually rare, one in 100,000, um, you can imagine, for instance, in the tri-state area, we've got 20 million individuals um, who come to see me from you know, Connecticut, uh, New Jersey, New York. Um, and when you start thinking about that, one in 100,000 with two, two, 20 million people in the neighborhood means that we've still got 200 people potentially um, that are just in our in our backyard. And so we've done this bringing families together from around the world, from around the United States. These are just a couple examples, um, but it has been profoundly helpful, I think, for families to be able to meet each other. Uh, and even before we get to the point of having cures for these conditions, simply to learn from each other, to learn which things to watch for, practical tips in terms of things that have been helpful, um, even things that might seem trivial, but you know, how to be able to help someone sleep better if sleep is one of the issues. Um, and with that comes help and, and assistance, not just for the individual, but also, as you can imagine, uh, for parents as well. Next slide. So as we've done this, um, this is just an example from a large series we've done trying to apply the same strategy of the exome sequencing. And along the x-axis, I'm, I'm showing you several different types of conditions. And on the y-axis, what percentage of individuals we were able to diagnose from just this one test. And I will point out that to me, these are uh, sort of lower limits in terms of what the diagnostic yield is, because in many cases, people had had three, four, five, six tests before they got to this point. Um, and you can see that for individuals that had problems with hearing loss or deafness, um, vision loss or blindness, for instance, approximately 50% of people were diagnosed by this type of testing. You can see, as I was saying, for individuals with seizures, this is in the middle, uh, about 25% of individuals were genetically diagnosed. But even across a wide range of conditions, um, this is, uh, you know, kind of a one size fits all in terms of being able to come up with answers. So really very useful for many, many different types of people. Next slide. As we're doing this, um, 
we're thinking of it not just in terms of being able to get to an answer, that's incredibly important, but I would also argue that this is incredibly efficient and cost effective. And so even though this test is not free, it's, it's uh, not cheap, it actually ends up being much less expensive than the old way we would make diagnoses. So using things like MRIs or x-rays, um, doing biopsies, which we sometimes needed to do, doing other fancy genetic tests, uh, even without accounting for hospitalization costs or doctor's fees, we looked at a series of my patients and realized that it cost over $22,000 to come up with a diagnosis for them, as opposed to this one exome sequencing test, for instance, that in general costs less than $5,000. So able to do it and, and do it in, a, as I said, much more efficient way. Next slide. Um, as we're doing it, uh, I would argue that we can do this even now faster, um, and, and especially in acute situations where patients need the information desperately. And so I won't take credit for this work. This was a great vision from a fellow by the name of Stephen Kingsmore, really challenged us to be able to get this test done. Um, in the old days, we used to oftentimes get results of these tests in, measured in months, so in three, four, or five months. Um, and he's actually gotten this down to be able to make this now, make a diagnosis in the matter of hours. Um, or I would say routinely, we can do this in five to seven days, at least when we need to in the hospital in an intensive care situation, for instance. Next slide. So as we've done this, um, this gets us, uh, as I said, to being able to get this this testing done. We've now been thinking about how we do this um, really in very large numbers on scale. And so for one group of individuals who I think can benefit from this uh, quite a bit and help the research to be able to understand the condition better, um, we've done this for autism. Um, so this is a research study that's called SPARK, S-P-A-R-K, Simons Foundation Powering Autism Research for Knowledge. It's a research study that has as one component of it, genetic evaluation and exome sequencing. And it's meant to be a a way of also completely free of charge, being able to, if we find an answer, a genetic answer for someone's cause of autism, to get that information back to them and enable them to help be part of the answers for tomorrow for autism. So if anyone's interested, uh, sparkforautism.org is the website. You can go on there and read more about it. Next slide. Um, as we've been doing that, uh, we've been, uh, our goal in this is not a small goal. Um, it's actually to be able to uh, enroll 50,000 individuals with autism and their family members. Um, I'm very proud to say that in terms of individuals with autism, we have over 43,000 individuals with autism already in SPARC, and we've been doing this for just over two years, um, and over 110,000 individuals total, so individuals with autism plus their family members. So really off to a very strong start in terms of understanding this better, and uh, for anyone who might, as I said, be interested, the URL is down here. Next slide. So as we've done this, um, we've been thinking about how we can convert this into um, molecular treatment. So not being able to just make the diagnosis, but to in fact, dare I say, cure with a capital C. Um, and I'm gonna tell you the story of what to me is one of the most exciting developments. Um, it didn't happen overnight. It took uh, really a lot of brilliant people to think about this. But the condition I'm, I'm talking about here is called spinal muscular atrophy. Um, I'm gonna use the past tense here and hope I'm correct, but it used to be the most common genetic cause of death for children less than a year of age. Um, this is a condition that's quite tragic because it's a de rapidly degenerative condition where babies are born apparently normal, um, but lead to, over the course of often months, weakness in the muscles due to loss of what we call particular nerve cells called motor neurons um, and become uh, essentially so weak that they can't even breathe. Um, so the babies who are most severely affected, like this baby on the left, um, have come to the ultimately die from the inability to be able to breathe on their own. Um, and this condition is actually fairly common. Uh, approximately one in 10,000 babies are born with this condition. And again, let me underscore, it's a degenerative condition. It actually, you lose these nerve cells over time. So I won't go into all of the molecular details, but uh, my Christmas present a couple of years ago was actually the FDA approval for Spinraza. Uh, just as a disclosure, I have no financial connection to Spinraza or to any of the treatments from Biogen or anyone else that have to deal with this. Um, but in terms of this, uh, we did know that at the time 
we started doing a, a newborn screening pilot, which I'll explain in a second. Um, we did not have spindomerase yet approved, but it did look like it was a possibility in terms of something that prevents the neurodegeneration. Um, this is a medication that's given, it's actually given to the spinal cord where these nerves come out to be able to prevent them from dying. But uh, I wanna underscore again, prevent. That is that we needed to try and identify these babies before they became symptomatic to prevent the problems. So you'll see on the right, um, for those of you who have had kids, um, you'll, you may or may not remember, but for all newborn babies in New York State and actually around the country, uh, we stick their heels, we do a heel prick and put some drops of blood on a filter paper and we screen them uh, in part of a public health program called newborn screening to try and see if they're going to be at risk for any conditions. And we thought to ourselves that for this condition, we could actually screen babies from that same filter paper that was already being collected, screen them to see if they were going to develop spinal muscular atrophy, with the idea being that if we could identify them, even with the first few days of life, they could get uh, access to the treatment and potentially be able to prevent the complications. Um, that is, that they could remain healthy. Next slide. So as we did this, uh, I hope, um, Joanne, you can play the video. Um, I don't know if you can tap on it. Yep, just tap there on the arrow. So this was actually the first baby that we identified in January 2016. She was predicted to have infantile spinal muscular atrophy, and she started with the, the Spinraza treatment, actually within the first two weeks of life. And this was just a home video from her mom showing some of her first steps. Um, she's now just over two years of age and a strong, healthy toddler um, with a mind of her own. Um, but she would have, without having had this treatment, uh, unfortunately died from this condition or be permanently on a breathing machine, a respirator to help her breathe. Um, so this really shows the remarkable impact that this, this one-two punch, this early diagnosis with the therapy that's available to be able to uh, identify and prevent these conditions. Um, for those of you who are following this, um, there is now gene therapy or gene replacement uh, that's in clinical trials right now for the same condition. So uh, Avexis, um, which has recently been acquired by Novartis, is now even uh, potentially a better treatment in the sense that it can be, a, I call it one and done. A single time treatment that again, after these babies are born and identified by newborn screening, this treatment could be given to them through a, a peripheral IV, um, even just one time as an outpatient and completely prevent this condition. Next slide. So thinking about this, um, there are real opportunities, I think, in terms of being able to um, think about this as a paradigm for how we can have molecularly-based treatments and even getting to gene replacement. Um, I've been talking a lot about rare diseases, um, and although that is mostly what I do, I wanna show you that even some of this can be applied to more common diseases. And I won't take you through too much of the biology, but this is actually showing a part of the brain, uh, the hypothalamus that's responsible for um, regulating our body weight. So being able to think about hunger and satiety and how much we eat and how much energy we expend. And the point of this slide is showing that there are signals that are coming from places like your stomach, places like your fat or your adipose tissue, your pancreas, that are sending signals to your brain telling you sort of long-term, how much energy do I have stored away? Uh, if, I'm, if I'm gonna need a little bit of extra energy later, if there's a famine coming up um, or what I had for lunch uh, and whether or not it's time to be eating or you know whether or not you're full. So the reason I show this here is because I won't go through all the details, but there are particular molecules that are very important in being able to transduce these signals. And there are individuals who are, who are in fact quite rare, but that have genetic problems, um, genetic mutations within portions of this signal. Next slide. And so those individuals actually have genetically determined causes for obesity. Again, they're not very common, but single genes that lead them to the point where they never feel full, where they just, um, they're, they're not bad people, but they eat a lot because they never feel full. They never, it's like their thermostat in their brain, but their adipostat for their brain, if you will, uh, is just misset. And so uh, individuals have one critical element in this is something called the melanocortin-4 receptor. And individuals who have mutations in that actually have what we believe is the most common genetic cause of obesity um, by having a deficiency of that signal, being able to receive that signal. So 
uh, there is a sort of obvious thing to do in terms of therapeutics, which is to develop, therefore, a melanocortin-4 receptor agonist. That is to be able to take that receptor and turn it on, to activate it, to make individuals feel full uh, so that they wouldn't continue to eat. And so this is actually in clinical trials like that right now. Um, this is not FDA approved yet, but this is in clinical trials uh, for the four forms of obesity. And when you think about this, it is now in clinical trials for very specific genetic forms of obesity, um, but long-term, it may be that this is a more generalizable approach in terms of being able to treat many individuals who have weight problems. Next slide. So as we think about that, um, we are at Columbia trying to go the next stage. So I started uh, about three years ago, this Discover program, which, which I had mentioned. But now within the last year, we've actually started the next chapter, uh, which I call treatment. And it's really thinking again about we still need to fill in some gaps. So we still need to do targeted research and exploration. But now it's very goal-directed, advancing trial models, clinical trial models, editing, meaning gene editing and gene therapy for the next generation of therapies. And as we're doing this, um, we're now taking what we've learned in terms of many of these rare genes genetic conditions. We're doing all of the things we need to do with families in terms of understanding the natural history, learning how to support each other, and developing the, I call them reagents, but developing the tools we we need to understand how these genes or disruptions of these genes lead to these conditions, and then using that to, as we think about the mechanism, develop therapies, be they gene therapy, small molecule gene editing, uh, but ways to be able to eventually um, either support, if not cure, those individuals. Next slide. So as we're doing it, um, we're doing it and we're making, I should say, all of this information freely available to the community. This is not um, you know, something we want to uh, you know, hold back. We want to be able to uh, give the people who have the tools to be able to develop these treatments, uh, be able to help them, and also to help bring the, the community together in terms of the community of patients that can benefit from this um, and be able to support clinical trials and therapies for this. So just briefly in uh, conclusion, uh, I hope you've gotten a sense that as we're doing this, um, we are trying to diagnose individuals faster, cheaper, more efficiently, get them to the answers that they need, and then be able to push them beyond that. In some cases, uh, using all the resources we have at Columbia in terms of researchers, uh, expert clinicians, um, ways of being able to go through and use mouse models for things, but being able to use all of those tools, and even in some cases, be able to do population-based screening where necessary to make sure that we can ensure the long-term health of the individuals in the community. So next slide. Um, I just want to be able to acknowledge that it takes a real team to be able to do all of this. I'm, I'm really fortunate to work with some just incredible clinicians and scientists. And on the very last slide, uh, certainly I'm happy to take questions now. But if folks have questions later, I think my email is on the last slide. And, and I welcome you having you reach out to me also uh, even beyond today. So I'll stop there. Wow. Well, thank you, Dr. Chong. You've really got an amazing program and, and great progress. Uh, Dr. Molina, would you like to start off with the question period? Yes. Uh, well, first of all, really beautiful and impressive uh, work, Wendy. I really congratulate you. Um, you. It, it, this is so, uh, to me, so interesting and that it triggers my imagination. Uh, and I dare to dream uh, in the long term. So I will have a, a general question for you. Um, how far away do you think we are from a practical point of view? How far away do you think we are from being able to integrate different pieces of technology like uh, uh, exome sequencing, uh, genomics technology, uh, pharmacogenomics, uh, pharmacology databases, blockchain technology and stuff. How, how far away do you think we are uh, to be able to integrate all these technologies and being able to serve the patients uh, in a fast way and also in a cheap way so we can, let's say, uh, approach and serve as many patient, uh, patients as, as possible? 
Mm-hmm. Well, certainly, I think in terms of, um, I, I think I have specifically tried to make this as, if you will, lean and mean as we can, um, being able to decrease the costs as much as possible. And the costs have decreased tremendously. Um, I do think it is now just, um, as I was alluding to with some of the numbers, it actually is more cost effective if you carefully select both by age, severity, and education. Um, so in our patient population, it's very clear that this is probably tenfold cheaper and more efficient to be able to get to the point of making the diagnosis. Um, as you said, we've been, we are still learning. Um, there are 20,000 genes. I think we currently really understand about 4,500 genes in terms of the diseases they cause in humans, which means there's still a lot of information we don't yet understand. Um, and we are developing through uh, things like essentially artificial intelligence, but deep neural networks and machine learning, developing ways of being able to see which regions of the genome actually are, are likely to cause disease and in fact match with diseases in particular patients. Um, and as we use machines and algorithms to do this, we get more and more efficient. It takes less brain power. It takes, in terms of scalability, we're able to offer this to more and more people. And in fact, the cost that paired with the cost of generating the data coming down, um, you really could get this down to easily less than $500 per patient to make a diagnosis, I'm convinced, within the next few years. Um, so with that, you know, I think all of that's the, the first chapter. You've, you, I think, in my opinion, you've got to know what it is you're treating to get to the treatment. The next big part of this is really thinking about the, the ways of treating it. And for that, um, I think the big gap is going f- You know, finding the gene is the easy part in some ways. Being able to now understand the mechanism and understand, you know, do you need more of the gene or less of the gene? You know, start with that portion alone. Um, If, you know, if it is that you can replace the gene in some way, can you do this at any time in the life uh, span? Or do you need, is there a certain window of opportunity in which you can do that treatment? Um, Do you need to be able to get the treatment to a certain portion of the body? Um, And if so, can you get it there? Or is it a protected portion of the body? Um, You know, as you're doing this, it would be nice to be able to do a one-time treatment if it were possible. Um, Can you do that? Can you be able to get a durable, lasting treatment if you're doing something like gene replacement? So there are a lot, a lot of different sort of pieces, but there are really, you know, as I've been thinking about this, about 10 critical questions that you have to ask yourself for each disease. And as, as you can come up with the answers to those, it becomes clear to me what type of strategy to use therapeutically. And the good thing is there are a lot of smart people, a lot of uh, small companies, biotech companies, but also large pharmaceutical companies, they've got something, they've, they've got a tool, they've got a hammer, a screwdriver, a wrench, something that they can apply. And now they're trying to figure out what diseases to apply it to. And so, you know, what I like doing is thinking about the patients and the use cases, if you will, um, and being kind of the matchmaker, being able to think about whether you need a hammer, a chisel, a screwdriver in each use case for patients, um, and then being able to think about how to match those up and pair them up. And I, I think we've got those opportunities and they're growing. Okay. So do, do you think that all the... Uh pieces of technology that we will need are already there and it is now it's a matter of refining them and combining the right ones so or do you think that in that let's, call, let's say a swiss army knife of technologies we are still lacking some 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 important ones Yeah, well, it's clear that we're still lacking some, Um, and I want to be pretty clear. I don't know that we can solve everything. Um, You know, there are probably some conditions where there's a window of opportunity, and at least for certain people, we may be be beyond that window. Um, So I don't think everything is necessarily going to be solvable just by, you know, medications or molecules. There will be some that require hardware and surgery and other things, um, but we will be able to support people. Um, I think it's early days for certain things. I think it's, you know, people talk about gene editing and being able to do things with manipulating that. I think we still have a pretty far way to go, even though CRISPR-Cas9 is remarkable in terms of what it can do. Um, There still can be off-target effects. Uh, We still can't necessarily get into every single cell where we need to. Um, So I think we're early days in some dimensions, but just the fact that we have already have some successes with things like spinal muscular atrophy give me the sort of energy and courage to dream about other possibilities. Thank you very much. Really, really nice. Thank you. So we have, uh, thank you very much. Uh, This is a great program. Uh, We have uh, one question from our audience, which I'll read to you and uh, feel free anybody else if you'd like to add a question. 
Um, it is amazing that you have discovered about 41 genes previously unidentified to be involved in a rare disorder. How many of these genes already had compounds developed to modulate them? For example, uh, with there being so much overlap between genes in different conditions. In this situation, it seems that identification of a gene involved may lead immediately to a treatment previously unknown through an already available medication. Right. So I wish I could say that um, we had any of those 41 genes associated with the treatment. Um, at this point, at least, um, the 41 genes that we've identified, even though in some cases we now understand mechanism pretty well, um, we still do not have for any of those 41 yet a uh, small molecule of treatment to gene therapy, at least that's been tried and put through clinical trials and is demonstrated to be effective. Um, to give you some sense of time frame, you know, I've started doing this over the last, uh, say, five years or so in terms of, you know, how long it's taken. And as many of you, I think, realize, um, the usual time it takes to go from target identification to eventually FDA-approved treatment is oftentimes on the order of 20 years. For, for SMA, we thought it was remarkable, and, and that had been cut down to approximately 10 years. So I guess I'm not surprised that we don't yet have anything for any of those 41 genes. Um, and I do think we're going to accelerate and go faster in certain cases. But uh, in some cases, for some of these genes, these are brand new genes that we don't even know what those genes do. Um, you know, we're very, very early stages. So um, some, some things, it's very clear. They're in families, as I think you're alluding to. They're in pathways. We can make some leaps of faith in terms of how other things work that are similar. So I'm, I'm uh, optimistic in some cases, but they're not all the same, and some are going to be easier than others. Well, I'd like to take a moment just to share a little bit about the efforts that we're making to build upon uh, the wonderful work that you're doing, Dr. Chung, and, and bringing you together with uh, other thought leaders uh, in, in different areas geographically and in different aspects. And uh, I want to publicly thank you for agreeing to join the advisory board for the Rare Disease Hub that we're launching this spring. Um, we will be holding our Rare Disease Symposium on July 18th at Iona College, and uh, you'll be receiving, everybody who's on the call will be receiving notices about that. I hope you'll all join us. Um, and I do want to encourage uh, folks, if this is an area of interest for you and you'd like to get involved as we're doing our planning and development, we'd certainly appreciate hearing from you. Uh, the, the idea of to start off is to deal with everything but the building uh, and build a community and start providing some programs and bringing people together. And that, but ultimately we think we'd like to build a rare disease institute that would be a physical place, a soft landing environment for international researchers to be able to uh, learn about the U.S. marketplace and, and uh, collaborate with institutions here. Um, so, Dr. Chung, is there any final comment you'd like to make? And then I'm going to ask you, Dr. Molina. No, I, I mean, I just want to say that, um, you know, what, what you all are doing in the rare disease space, um, it's certainly, as I said, I, I find New York to be an especially exciting place to be able to do this just because we've got such a international community that from a genetic uh, point of view has a lot of different gene pools in there. Um, it's often a destination place for people to come to be able to seek care and seek help, um, and it's just a wonderfully collaborative community. So um, I'm, I'm thrilled to be affiliated with you guys, and uh, I know it's going to be an exciting opportunity going forward. Well, thank you so much. And uh, Antonio, I would like to let you have the final word. Well, uh, first of all, it's really exciting to me uh, to see uh, this kind of work, like uh, the one that Dr. Chang presented to us today. Uh, we, I see the science is advancing so fast uh, that it really makes me dream uh, ahead, far, far away ahead. But I agree with Wendy when, when she said that uh, there are still a lot of things to do before we can apply very efficiently this, this, all these kinds of uh, technology. So. The good part is that uh, we have uh, many things to have fun with in the next many, many years. And I think, uh, I, I agree with Wendy, I think we are in the right spot, geographical spot right now. 
to push and I mean combine different people, different mindsets, different backgrounds, um, and try to uh, emerge with a with a exciting project that will end up putting uh, drugs and treatment in the in the market. Uh, I really think that we will be seeing many many exciting things in the in the next year. So uh, stay tuned. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Chung. Thank you, Dr. Molina. Thank you, Michael Welling. Thank you, Chris Kinzel, who put, who's quietly watching and put all of this together for us. And uh, thank you to everyone who shared with us today. Uh, within a few days, we'll have this up on YouTube and we'll send out a note. Thank you so much. Take care. <laughs>